Time and time again, I find myself reading through Native American myths and legends, or religions if you prefer. And every time, I'm truly amazed at the variety of tales. Really, even when we say Native American or Indian, it's a failure to realize there are as many or more different tribes and societies within that Native American label as there are any other racial group, and each of them has their own traditions. A lot of times, when my daughter asks me to tell her a story, I usually riff on one of these stories that comes to my mind in that moment. It's a fun way to tell a story that not a lot of people have heard, and maybe help keep something alive that might otherwise die. My last few episodes, Gilgamesh Part 1 and Part 2, and The Book of Enoch, got a pretty good response. Thanks for that. And because of that, I wanted to pick a theme somewhat related to those narratives as a launching point for this episode. And, in a roundabout way, it led me to the story of Wakinyan Tonka, or the Great Thunderbird. Now I must admit, years ago before I got into any of this sort of stuff, I had only loosely heard about Thunderbirds as it relates to Native Americans, and it was within the framework of cryptozoology. Cryptozoology is the realm of legends like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Chupacabra. But it's not all conspiracy and tall tales. Cryptozoology also encompasses the search for animals like the extinct thylacine in Australia, which we believe to be extinct, but gets a reported sighting from time to time. There's a really good Willem Dafoe movie called The Hunter, centered around this. There are plenty of other creatures you probably don't consider to be cryptids, the term given to these mysterious animals, that were in fact once in the realm of cryptozoology. The giant squid, an armored fish called the coliconth, and even the mountain gorilla were all scientific unknowns at one point that existed only in legends and folk tales to much of the world. One tendency we have when we look at old stories is to try and interpret them through a more modern, scientific reality lens. Thunderbirds are no exception. So when the modern world started hearing stories about a massive bird in antiquity, we were tempted to start looking for ways to rationalize it. And indeed, there were a few candidates that popped up. As a youngster, the first time I heard about Thunderbirds, it was suggested that perhaps some small population of pterosaurs, think pterodactyl-like dinosaur birds, managed to survive the eons in remote locations, and perhaps due to their massive size, they were associated with storms because they could fly on the air currents delivered by the storm. Others suggested the stories may have originated when the natives stumbled on pterosaur fossils, which would have appeared as massive birds. No pterosaur need actually survive. Moving forward in time yet again, surviving Ice Age era birds like the Terratorns, with wingspans from 15 to 30 feet, and confirmed living as recently as 11 to 12,000 years ago, are also suggested to be the root of the Thunderbird story. Sightings of massive birds still happen. In the 1940s, in Illinois, a group of people saw what they assumed to be an airplane, and then it flapped its wings. Similar events were reported in Missouri about the same time, but in Missouri, they settled on the Great Blue Heron as the culprit. And more recent still, in the 2000s, sightings of near-aircraft-sized birds were reported in both Alaska and Texas. And that could be. Maybe there are or were a couple of giant birds, like a prehistoric pteratorn, living in remote areas that occasionally strayed into our sight as they rode the storms in the same way an eagle rides the drafts in the mountains. But the Thunderbirds are a theme in quite a few stories from quite a few tribes, and they aren't necessarily rigidly described as merely giant birds. Quite frequently, when it comes to myth or even modern religion, we go trying to strip away the supernatural from a story, chasing our rigid reason and rationale. We tend to miss the story itself and any value it might have offered to the people at the time or even today. One story that stood out to me that I think you'll particularly enjoy if you liked the last few episodes is affiliated with the Sioux of South Dakota. Now this isn't any one version, but bits and pieces from a few sources I'll link to on an accompanying blog post over at WaitingInPodcast.com. So here goes. Wakinyan Tonka, the Great Thunderbird, and grandson of the Creator Spirit, once lived atop a mountain in the Black Hills. His voice is the thunder, and the rolling thunder that follows is that of his children. In all, there were four great thunderbirds. The greatest of these is the Wakinyan to the west, who is clothed in clouds. His body has no form, but he has giant wings. No feet, but massive, powerful claws. 
No head, but an enormous beak filled with razor-sharp teeth. His color is black. The Wakinian of the north is red, the one in the east is yellow, and the Wakinian of the south is white and has no eyes or ears, though he can still see and hear. A single feather from a thunderbird is said to be nearly as large as a man. The thunderbirds are always wrapped in clouds. No one has ever seen a whole thunderbird, not even the most holy man in his dreams and vision, gets even more than a fleeting glimpse. But their presence can be felt, and it will fill you with fear and dread. But it is only a test of your courage, for the thunderbirds are helpful beings, the guardians of truth, and look after the morality of humans. And if you are fortunate enough to get a dream or vision of a thunderbird, you gain some of his power for a time. Now, the great Unktehi is the opposite of the Wakinian, a gigantic horned water serpent who detested humans. Unktehi lived in the large rivers and her children in the smaller streams and lakes. What are these creatures called humans? They are like parasites, and we have no use for them, Unktehi pondered. We must get rid of them. So she and her kin proceeded to flood the rivers and streams of all the land in an effort to wipe out the humans and take the earth for themselves. The humans ran for higher ground. Many were killed, and even on the highest peak, the waves began to threaten them. The humans cried out for help. And the great thunderbird heard them and spoke. The humans are descended from my grandfather, the Creator, and they are our family, and they revere us. Even though they are weak and often immoral, they are here for a purpose. We must save them. So the Thunderbirds gathered and set out to war against the great serpent Unktehi and her offspring. Thunder roared and powerful lightning struck the Unktehi. The Thunderbirds fought with all of their might, but the horned serpents were just as powerful in their own right, gouging out great wounds with their horns and teeth, their thick scales protecting them. The war raged for years, and the great Thunderbird himself grappled with the great serpent Unktehi. Finally, in desperation, the great Thunderbird cried out to his family, We are losing. The serpents are too strong to be fighting on the ground or near the waters. This terrain favors them. We must retreat, regroup, and come up with a plan. So the Thunderbirds left the battle and followed the great Wakinian to his mountain. We are the masters of the sky, he said. I was wrong to lead us into battle with Unktehi and her kin on the earth and near the water where they are the strongest. Follow me now, and we will fight together as one, on our own terms, on my command. So the Thunderbirds set back out to war, though this time as a single unit. When I give the order, let all of us command thunder and lightning onto the earth at once. And then the great Wakinian gave the order, and all of the Thunderbirds used their power to strike the earth with lightning in a single instant. The forests caught fire, and even the rocks in the ground started to glow red hot except for the mountain holding the remaining humans. The floodwaters were evaporated, and despite her power, Unktehi and her kin were burned alive, and their bones turned into rock. The serpents were defeated and destroyed, and the thunderbirds became the new masters of the water, as well as the sky. When the storms subsided, the humans climbed down from the mountain, forever grateful of the thunderbirds. Now, Many of the northern tribes have similar stories where the serpents are drained away into cracks in the earth. Underworld serpents, anyone? Or they escape to the deepest parts of the ocean. Sea serpents, anyone? In a story from the Kiliute tribe, the serpent doesn't even make an appearance, and it is the Thunderbird himself who is tired of the humans and causes the Great Flood. The humans in that story survive by building boats. There's another set of stories from various tribes in the Pacific Northwest involving the Thunderbird that see him trying to catch a great whale of various names, which is often depicted as a killer whale. The fight between the Thunderbird and the whale is epic. It clears entire forests and leaves the landscape barren and scarred. Every time the Thunderbird manages to catch the whale, the whale manages to escape, and the Thunderbird eventually gives up, and the whale retreats to the depths of the oceans. In a similar story, the Thunderbird catches the whale and takes him to his nest, but he decides to rest for a while before devouring him. Some humans end up helping the whale escape, and as punishment, the Thunderbird turns them all into stone. So the Thunderbirds aren't just a giant bird someone might have seen one time. They are quite frequently a supernatural, godlike force to be reckoned with. 
The feeling of fear or terror associated with the presence of the Thunderbird sounds exactly like the fear of judgment, if you ask me. And if you are courageous and good, you have nothing to fear, and they may even help you. But if you cross them, you might end up being struck by lightning or turned into stone. Still, it is fun to think about a pterodon tangling with a small whale on the northwest coast, or perhaps an isolated population of Ice Age megabirds riding the storm clouds in the mountains. If you enjoyed the last few episodes, hopefully you can see why I thought this episode was fun. Flood myths pop up all over the freaking place, and they take on various forms. Is it just because flooding is a destructive force we've observed and wanted to explain since we first opened our eyes? Or was there some sort of late Ice Age mega pandemic like the Younger Dry's impact theory that wiped the slate clean that gets talked about by men like Randall Carlson? Or was there a period of massive lightning storms brought out by solar events, as suggested by Boston University's Dr. Robert Scotch? And could it have been supernatural, as so many religions seem to claim? Or are these just stories? What do you think? If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on whatever platform you use. You can also like the Facebook page or follow me on Minds. I'll leave links to those in the notes. I also maintain WaitingInPodcast.com, where I'll have blog posts now and again, with some extra content related to the episodes of the podcast, as well as links to books and reference material I use to help me make the show. Do me a favor, and share the podcast if you like it. That's all I had for this episode. See you next time. Music and sounds in this episode, in order of occurrence, The Complex, by Kevin McLeod. Available at Incompetech.com. Licensed by Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Thunder Dreams by Kevin McLeod and available at Incompetech.com. Licensed via Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Thunder HD. Recorded by Mike D'Angelo. Licensed by Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thunder Sound FX. Recorded by Grant Evans. Licensed through Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. The Descent by Kevin McLeod. Available at Incompetech.com. Licensed through Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. If you like lore and legends, consider supporting the show at buymeacoffee.com slash lore and legends with a one-time gift that will cost less than a cup of coffee. You can also follow on Instagram, where my handle is at loreandlegends1, and on Twitter at loreandlegends3. You can also subscribe to the Lore and Legends YouTube channel, which features video versions of all your favorite episodes. And of course, the official website, loreandlegends.net. Thanks for checking out Lauren Legends. See you next time.